Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Je suis, <rire> je suis le directeur de l'Alliance. So, pour le protocole, je dois parler en premier. C'est normal. Sorry. In terms of protocol, I have to welcome you because I am the host, Alliance Française de Legos, Michael Nunga Center, and I cannot, I cannot begin without telling you how honored I am being with you. And I cannot respect the protocol fully tonight because there's too many very, very important people they know. And uh, so, but I just wanted to, 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 to say for that you are very, very welcome. Of course, this is your evening, don't worry. I don't speak after. But for us, it's very important. Alliance Française as a French culture network, you know it's the first network in the world in terms of culture. And uh, Michael Dunga Center, who is one of the big arts and culture sponsors with this project, it has been very, very, I think it's a very important project among other projects that you know. I, I won't quote these projects right now because you are all involved, I know, in arts and culture. So what we are doing here is something very important. Yesterday we had schools from the mainland. Today we, has 100, we had 100 students of Unilag here. For the first time they saw this kind of, uh, you know, international standard facilities, art gallery, uh, auditorium and everything. So we are here for everyone, but we are especially here for arts and culture. And um, as a collector, as an art lover, from all my times in uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Scotland, Vietnam, everywhere. I met for the first time Oliver, and I met for the first time Prince uh, Shilon and all the people, and I said, I am trapped in art. My, I have a problem. I am, I am crazy about art. You know if you are a collector what it can be. So it's like being in love. I am, I am in love always. All my life I'm in love with things I see and there's a very big problem when you need to buy them and you can't or you don't have space in your, in your, in your flat. That's my case in France. So, yes, I'm personally very involved in that, very, very interested in the topics you are, you are discussing. I was so sad to be in Abuja for the first session, but I said to Oliver, I will be here for the second and for all the other ones. So I am with you as a host, but also as a as, a, as an art lover, and I really, really want to congratulate you for what you are doing for this country, because it's, it's very important. Just one, one thing, last thing. When I was in Ethiopia, I was in a very underprivileged and a very poor area, very poor area. And one time I spoke to an artist and I said, sometimes I feel ashamed. We spend money for arts, and we could buy you some injera, some bread. And he said, who do you think we are? It's not because we are poor that we are not human. And as human, we need art as much as we need bread. So what you are doing in Nigeria is very important. And I see you are rare. You are not many, many, many like I saw in Jobo, in Johannesburg, in South Africa. Only a few people here are doing the job. And you are doing that so well. Honestly, I congratulate you. You are great. Merci Olivier, merci tout le monde. Thank you very much. Sorry, I needed to say that first. Now it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Houdon. Did I get that right? Thank you very much for that lovely welcome address. Well, um, I'm Uyino Ahiremen. I work with the Benemu Foundation. I will be your anchor for tonight. Just a quick one from our media team. We'll be streaming live on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Our social media handles and the hashtag will be showing on this screen shortly in case you want to share with your friends and your loved ones who would have loved to make it but couldn't for one reason or the other. This edition, titled Raising Capital Against High Value Works of Art, will be focused on providing insight on the numerous ways Nigerian art can serve 
as an alternative asset class. Okay. To officially begin the conference, the opening remarks will be given by the founder and executive director of the Benemu Foundation, as well as the president of the Society of Nigerian Artists. He's also the founder of Omenka Gallery and Omenka Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Oliver Imuwu. Well, on behalf of the Bene Wawu Foundation and the Society of Nigerian Artists, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the second edition of Point of View, which aims to highlight the role of art in shaping society positively through public and private sector partnership and artist professional development. Today promises to be a most exciting evening as Nigerian art continues to gain global attention with staggering auction results. On our part, here, we have to lay the structures and policies that will build upon these successes as well as sustain them. To provoke thought on how to raise capital against investment-worthy works of art, we have distinguished speakers and panelists who will no doubt do justice to charting a new course for modern and contemporary Nigerian art. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back and relax. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. To deepen our understanding of what the Benemu Foundation is about, we have prepared a short documentary. Please sit back and enjoy as we take you through Benemu's legacy. Thank you. Tradition helps us understand the present. It is a wisdom that uncovers our basic nature. Master sculptor and painter Ben Nwenwu returns to the rituals of his youth and visualizes their hidden spirituality. In the process, he discovers his own essence. Well, my art began when my father was carving in the shrine at Onicha, in the village. And uh, he did lots of uh, images, traditional images, which were then regarded as, uh, you call them gods. And uh, the, the effects it had on me was one of uh, fear, uh, because I used to be afraid of them. But when my father died, before I grew into boyhood, I began to look at things and to try to make my own images. I began to draw on the sand. After each rain, it more or less was a slate, a clean slate. Then I drew with a broomstick. Broomstick was my first pencil and the sand was my paper. I uh, uh, went to my um, home, uh, to Nietzsche, and uh, because we have ceremonies, traditional ceremonies, funeral ceremonies, I just began to uh, use some of the uh, traditional dances. In Nigeria, masquerades are village ceremonies that make use of dance, costume, and music to invoke spirits, the honorable dead. The masquerade acts out religious beliefs. Over all hovers the supernatural. The dance movement must have a mask associated with it, but the mask itself was not the whole thing. In fact, the dancer and the movement he made 
were the, the whole thing. The mask was only uh, a feature uh, signifying his personality or the personality of the goddess or god or goddess that he represented. <laughs> I now consider it a very important period in my work. It's taking me back to my roots with my father. One of the things I remember he said to people who doesn't appreciate that was, if you haven't heard of Ben, then you haven't been to school. You can never bring up a discussion about visual art and never mention the name Ben Ngo. He lived for art, he dreamt art, he loved nature. My husband found beauty in things that don't count important. I am Caroline. My native name is Obiagili. I'm married to Professor Ben Ngo and we have four children. I'm one of them, Miss Oliver. I'm Oliver Nwong, and I'm executive director of the Ben Nwong Foundation. I would say that no other Nigerian artist before him has been entrenched in our national consciousness. The Ben Nwong Foundation was established in the year 2003 to preserve the Ben Nwong's legacy. Ben Nwong was the most influential artistic figure of the 20th century and has been hailed since the 1950s as Africa's greatest artist. In 1957, he was commissioned to sculpt the bronze portrait of a ruling monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, and the seating began at Buckingham Palace. Also, he was the first federal art advisor to the government. Other famous works of his include Ayawu, or the awakening which today stands at the United Nations headquarters. So what made Benu's art an object of interest? It's often mentioned that his visual language fused Western techniques and indigenous traditions together to create what is now known as African modernist art. He interpreted modern aesthetics while paying allegiance to his culture. One important symbol that recurs in his work is womanhood. He feels women are beautiful. And for him, the woman is a symbol of nationhood. The foundation is established in honor of men and women. And as much as possible, we try to project his values and that's why the foundation deems it fit to preserve his legacy for generations yet unborn, to imitate, to copy, to emulate, and to continue his path. One of the ways the foundation hopes to achieve this is through continuing artist professional development and empowerment. And the foundation counts this necessary because a lot of Nigerian artists never know much beyond the rudiments of art. Because a lot of Nigerian artists, when they go to school, they only taught the rudiments of art. You know, how to paint, you know, perspective, anatomy. You know, they were not taught how to sustain themselves outside the four walls of the school. I was in the business world, for instance. The Benoit Foundation has taken it upon itself to ensure that it is able to empower artists when it comes to business. The foundation is located in the artist's home, which lends to its cultural and historical significance. Within the premises, there's the Omenka Gallery. Omenka Gallery is a leading gallery in Lagos, and indeed, Nigeria. And it represents a diverse number of artists working in different media. Some of our artists we have showcased on the international scene, where we've participated in major art fairs all over the world on about five continents. We also have an active publications program where we produce critical text to accompany their work as a way of exposing them to new and international audiences while encouraging research into their work. A lot of people think art is purely decorative, but I say no and the foundation says no. 
One of the things the Foundation is trying to do is to ensure we change our perception through programs like our Distinguished Lecture Series, where we have people from all walks of life come to speak about the changing role of art in society. They have also had scholarship schemes for students of Ahmad Bello University, Yaba College of Technology, and of course, University of Ife, now Obafemi Awolowo University. Um, for instance, one of the major topics today, you know, on the contemporary art scene is artists uh, resale rights. You know, while musicians and authors benefit from secondary sales of their works and their royalties, you know, Nigerian visual artists do not. And that's why there's so much global attention right now on African art. I mean, and I think that's a major subject that uh, um, the Benoit Foundation and, of course, uh, the French uh, Cultural Center, Alliance Francaise, you know, they're looking into to see how we can change the enabling laws in order to ensure that artists you know, benefit from copyright sales, but with the enabling structures you know, in place, you know, to maybe even to ensure that uh, even funds and grants, you know, um, are used to support Nigerian artists. I think that uh, um, things will grow, you know, and uh, the sector will be sustained. Amazing. The foundation does a lot for art and culture in Nigeria, and I hope we can extend this to Africa as well. Our first presentation is on the Nigerian art market in transformation. New directions in lending, investment, and wealth management by Mr. Bola Ashiru. As we listen to his profile, he will make his way to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have to say, as I was watching that, I wasn't sure if uh, the speaker was talking about me. I was, I was quite overwhelmed. Very good um, uh, packaging. Um, this evening, I want to talk about uh, a topic that's rather complex, but I want to make it as simple as possible. Um, I come from a world of uh, financial services and derivatives and uh, complex instruments. Um, and these instruments are always used for one form of wealth management or the other, or as collateral as the case might be. Uh, but tonight, we're talking about a very simple, uh, um, um, shall I say, resource that we all have and we all love, art, and how that can be used uh, uh, as an instrument for wealth management and as, a, as collateral as well. So, uh, in terms of the topic, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, so it's the Nigeria art market in transformation, new directions in lending, investment, and, and wealth management. Uh, I've created just 10, uh, 10 slides, right? Uh, I want to start by talking about the art market and what drives the art market in Nigeria. Uh, I know a lot of us will know this already, but I think it's always good to go to first principles and establish that. Uh, I want to speak briefly about art as an asset. I'll speak about the enablers for converting art into something that we can actually use as collateral and investments. And then finally, critical success factors. I think overall, um, let me just say that uh, in terms of maturity, uh, the Nigerian environment is still at very nascent stages with regards to using art as, uh, as uh, uh, an investment or art as collateral. 
So I won't go too much into the mechanics, but rather I'll speak about what I feel are the enablers based on where we've seen it work in other environments. I think that's a better way for us to have the conversation, i.e. what do we need to do to get to where we want to uh, uh, actually get to. So um, why do we, I mean, what drives our art market today? Um, the first one is, you know, I probably think probably about 90% of the people here are driven by this. It's art for art's sake. It's because we love it. It's because there's an attraction that we feel towards the art, and we want to collect it, we want to acquire it. Uh, and this drives, this drives demand, certainly. But the truth is, uh, this is also heavily dependent on the economic cycle. For most galleries today, you're not competing against another gallery. You're not competing against uh, an auction house. You're competing against food and school fees and rent. These are the most basic things, right? So art for art's sake is important, but uh, it's heavily dependent on a buoyant economy and also just a, a positive spirit. Right? I mean, uh, I'm the founder of a gallery, and I see that whenever there's something of a festival going on, we see an uplift in sales. Uh, when there's positive news, there's an uplift in sales. But when there's a depression or economic downturn, it also impacts uh, uh, sales. So art for art's sake is just one form of demand. Um, the second one, again, not quite as uh, rampant as it should be here, is for monumental uh, uh, reasons. So during Festac 1977, for instance, the entire country was awash with commissions, uh, arts co various art commissions in the key centers for the, for the festival. So there was a huge demand which was driven by this. In other parts of the world, ever so often, there's a new uh, statue or monument that's coming up, and this keeps uh, the arts community vibrant and, and active. Uh, the third, third uh, driver for demand is just pure trading and commerce. Um, I know that sometimes in the art world, uh, profitability or, uh, uh, shall I say, you know, using the word commercial and art in the same sentence is, is not considered proper. But I think it's important for us to realize that it is a viable business, and people must apply the principles of commerce uh, into uh, actually running an art business. So uh, trading and, and commerce is another form of demand. So the galleries, the uh, uh, auction houses, and so on and so forth actually drive the demand. Then finally is why we're here today, is art as, a, as an asset class, where people are doing their research the same way you do research on whether to buy property in Banana Island or Moe. Uh, they would uh, do the analysis with regards to the previous sales prices over the last 10 years and the trends and make their projections. They'll get an advisor, uh, they'll acquire, and then they'll also uh, store the art and then you know, decide when their exits should be. It could be five years, it could be 50 years. Uh, uh, and this is, this is the area that we want to speak about. And it goes beyond individuals. Uh, there are also art funds that have art as the underlying asset. The truth is, when you're setting up a, a fund, um, it's up to you to decide what you want to use as the underlying asset. It could be gold, it could be property, it could be a mix of uh, uh, securities and bonds, uh, but it's up to the owners of the fund to decide what they want to uh, use as the underlying asset. There are several funds that today uh, use art and collectibles uh, as the underlying uh, asset. But again, uh, forgive me, I need to go to first principles. What exactly is an asset? Um, I was warned uh, a few weeks ago when I gave a, a talk that when you, sometimes when you make a presentation, you make an assumption that everybody knows some of the terms. So, I, I, so, so sometimes I think it's important to take a step back and define an asset, right? So it's something that has economic value, definitely, um, and it's owned by either an individual or, or a corporate. Uh, but the expectation that is that it will provide a future benefit, right? So at some point in the future, you'll be able to liquidate it. Today, when we look at the traditional asset forms, I'm giving you some examples there. There's something that holds through for all of them. Number one is that the valuation basis is clear. 
So if you tell me that a Dangote share is what X amount, uh, there's a reason for that valuation. And then you can do the analysis, and it's transparent, right? Um, the pricing is transparent. If you tell me that a plot of land is X amount in Ikoi versus uh, another area, the reasoning behind the pricing is, is also very clear. And finally, um, if you want to buy or sell any of these assets here, it's quite straightforward. Um, the stock exchange, you can uh, buy and sell as you wish. So these are the common traits with the traditional uh, asset, asset forms. But also, art is becoming an alternative uh, uh, asset class. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal for last year. And you'd be surprised to know that last year, the best uh, investment was art, followed by wine and cars. Right? And this is on the Wall Street Journal. And this is in terms of just returns. Right? So you put in a dollar, what do you get back in return? Uh, in terms of factor of uh, X, it's, it's, it was art last year. And then we get, this is the Nairobi Securities Exchange. This is a clipping saying they are proposing to introduce fine art as an asset class. This is just uh, uh, our neighbors uh, proposing to do this. So this is you know, it's just made up land somewhere in Banana Island. Um, typically, it has proven value, right? If it's on a particular street, particular area, the value is established, right? Um, it has, typically will have good and transferable title. Lagos State C of O is good and transferable. Um, if you have a property on it with a building plan, that's, again, even better, more value. Um, if it's been certified safe and sound by a structural engineering firm, even better. And finally, if it's clear of any indebtedness, encumbrance, or any ongoing litigation. So with that uh, title, you can go to a, a bank and you can raise cash using your property as collateral. Fully acceptable. You can also stay in the property but remortgage it or enter into a mortgage agreement where you access cash, but then the property is still, you know, is still uh, where you live. And then finally, you can even use it if it's a property that's located in a commercial area, and I've seen many people do this. You can use it as your equity stake in a business. So if there's a business of 100 million naira, everybody's looking for 20 million naira investment so that you have five shareholders, each owning 20%, you can actually put down your house as your equity uh, contribution and own 20% of, of, the, of the business. The truth is, this works excellently when you have all the things that I've out outlined earlier. But unfortunately, with the arts, even though it's, some arts pieces are worth uh, uh, a lot more than land, I mean, we just had a, uh, a few days ago uh, a sale of a, of a piece that's, um, Neil, how much was it? Yours. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I mean, a million pounds, 450 million naira. I mean, you can buy decent property here for that. So unfortunately, uh, uh, without the right frameworks, that, that uh, painting cannot be used to access uh, cash from a bank in Nigeria. So, I've spoken a lot from a perspective of this is what is missing. But in my world that I come from, whenever you see gaps, we tend to smile because it means there are opportunities. Um, whenever we see problems, we get excited because we need to, that means we can make money from the, from the opportunity. And this is exactly what is happening in the art world. Today, if you say that you're in the art world, people will tend to compartmentalize and put you into a box. You must either be an artist, gallery owner, or auction house. That's it. But the art value chain is so far reaching that there's so many points at which one can make money uh, that we haven't tapped into in, in Nigeria. Uh, so even creating good studio spaces and renting them out. There's an area in the, in the UK, um, Camden Town, just by Chalk Farm. There's some lovely studios. Somebody has converted old houses, and it's been rented out to artists, right? And it's fully, fully taken up. Uh, so right, that's the creative piece, right? Um, 
whenever I want to send my art abroad, I struggle to find someone who can actually build a good uh, uh, case for it, right? So that it doesn't get destroyed. Uh, where are the professional creators in Nigeria? I mean, if you say, what is the number one professional creating, art creating company in Nigeria? I'm sure most people cannot mention one, right? And we have so much demand and love for art, but there isn't one person doing art creating. And this is the situation here. All of these gaps are, you know, opportunities for all of us in this room. Um, so what do you need to be able to collateralize your art, right? Definitely a valuation report by a reputable gallery or auction house, right? Or it could even be an entity that has been set up just to do art valuation, that has credibility, that's presented to all the funds, presented to the banks, uh, presented to the insurance companies uh, at board level, uh, and has been accepted as a valuer of, of art. Right, so that's a standalone business. Anyone here with the right type of background can set it up. So it's a gap, but it's also an opportunity. Number two, that is absolutely critical, and unfortunately, I mean, we're all art lovers here, has become a real problem for anyone who really cares about art in Nigeria, and it's around provenance and authenticity. I think there's only one, if there's one thing that could potentially challenge the growing arts business in Nigeria today, it is this, right? Because there's been a lot of challenges around authenticating art, ensuring that the person that is selling the art or that is holding the art is actually entitled to, to hold on to it. So this, providing provenance and certification, again, absolutely key uh, uh, for valuation towards accessing cash. The third one I spoke about already, liquidity. Um, it's going to be very difficult for a bank or uh, a financial institution to extend you credit if they're not sure that if you default, they will be able to uh, retrieve their money to the sale of your art, right? So there needs to be proven liquidity uh, uh, evidence that they're viable buyers and sellers in a regulated uh, environment. And then finally, this one is very difficult to hold on to, but there must be confidence and trust in the market. In um, 2005, 2006, the Nigerian stock market was booming, and people were just confident, and people were actually selling their houses to invest in the stock market because there was confidence. Um, in 2008, we had a bit of a challenge. I don't think Nigeria has fully recovered. Uh, I don't think the stock market has ever had the type of activity and buoyancy that it had in 2008 particularly from local investors, not portfolio investors coming, uh, coming in. So confidence and trust is also very critical. And of course, having the right type of regulation in place is absolutely key. So from an art ecosystem perspective, what are the enablers, right? The enablers are the market data. Like I said, any, any one of us can actually set up businesses that provide this market data. Uh, professional valuation, providing uh, element of trust, absolutely critical, and then, like I said, uh, liquidity. And the liquidity channels can be both online or, or offline. Okay. Um, in terms of enablers from outside the arts community, uh, a lot of it has to do with the financial services uh, providers, the banks, uh, investment houses, and, and so on, and also the regulator. So we really need to start moving towards developing art-based financial products, uh, whereby you can bring your artwork, it can be valued, it can be stored professionally if the criteria is to store it, uh, and then you can access cash uh, from the art, artwork. Uh, for our fund managers as well, right now, if I want to do uh, wealth management, I'll be asked how much land I have, Possibly, if I have any precious stones, uh, uh, property, and things like that, but never art. It's never part of the conversation in, in Nigeria, and that needs to change. And it can only change when uh, the people who are going to manage the art are actually pushing it. It's not easy for us to actually force the, the banks to, to change their mindset. 
uh, they need to push it to us and say, look, if you have a piece of art, we can actually extend you 10 million Naira credits once we've done the valuation and we've proven that it's of, uh, it's of high value. So that is extremely key. And the second bit is from a regulator perspective. Uh, our central banks also, of course, they're trying to protect uh, uh, our financial system and ensure that it's stable. But we also need to be able to move forward with the times and uh, encourage uh, uh, alternative risk management frameworks that can uh, permit us to actually put up our art as, as collateral. So to recap, um, these are the main areas in terms of critical success factors uh, that we need to have in place to move uh, uh, our art market forward from an asset, uh, asset uh, and valuation perspective. Market trust and confidence, absolutely key. All of this that were, all the presentations that you might hear and all the talks that we're giving really uh, do not carry much weight if there's no trust. Right, trust is uh, trust in the market is is everything. So ensuring that that is there is absolutely critical. Uh, regulatory and policy guidelines I've spoken about, uh, very key. Market data and price discovery. Informal channels must be formalized. The example I gave earlier of the lady who was able to access some money for school fees is happening, and that's an informal channel that nobody has really tracked. We should formalize this. Uh, market credibility, uh, spoke about forgeries and theft. It's something that everyone in this room needs to work together to make sure we uh, eliminate. It's fast becoming a, a cancer uh, in the art world in Nigeria. Um, I've spoken about physical and uh, online channels. And then institutional demand is also very important. Uh, our museums, uh, our corporates, our art funds, uh, if they are active and demanding art, uh, of course, it will drive up demand and it will also make our financial institutions uh, uh, wake up and start to actually find out how they can uh, benefit from this uh, new asset class. Uh, and then finally, like I said, we need financial products. We actually need products, whether it's art credits, whether it's art insurance uh, or art loans, however you want to place it, these products need to be developed. So these, uh, in my view, are the critical success factors uh, that will actually take us from having art on the walls for art's sake into a situation whereby we can actually monetize uh, some of our collections uh, as financial, uh, through financial services. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Do you want to take questions or for the panel? Is it for the panel? I don't know. I can take it. Thank you very much. We'll be taking questions now, but because of time, we'll have only three questions. If we have any more questions, we can meet Mr. Bola Shiru after the conference. I'm sure he'll be willing to take it. Okay. Good evening, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jude Chemek. I work for the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Um, interesting presentation. Thank you so much for providing clarity. My question is around... Um, so. What do you think can be done very quickly that the long hanging fruits in terms of how we can actually bring this to the mainstream and begin to see trading occur in this particular asset class? Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of my favorite places to go and visit is the stock exchange because of your collection. Um, but um, I think very quickly, if we're talking about low-hanging food, something we can actually get up and running very quickly, is art credit. You know, again, it's happening informally every day. Um, I typically, most of the pieces that I like, I cannot afford. And I'm sure many people in the room will share this sentiment, right? So I pay, as they say, small, small. Okay? I, I have a relationship with a, a gallery, even though I'm a gallery founder, I still buy from galleries, or I have a personal relationship with an artist, I might pay 50% of that, the value of the art, and I spread the rest out, right? But that makes it a bit uncomfortable for the gallery because of cash flow. You know, they'd rather have 100%. The artist as well deserves to have 100% upfront. So what, we, what is lacking is an intermediary, someone to say, you know what? I will fund the artist or the gallery 100%, 
and then you pay back to the bank, right, with a bit of interest. Now, if for any reason you default, right, then the art becomes at risk, right? That's your, that's your collateral. We're doing it today with consumer finance, with uh, a lot of the new cars on the roads are financed. They're not bought with cash. We're doing it with uh, white goods, whether it's uh, TV or whatever else from game. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it for, for, for art if the factors that I mentioned earlier all hold true. So it cannot be for every single art piece, but for a particular pedigree, a particular uh, valuation of art. I think that's a low-hanging fruit that literally can be ready in you know, 90 days. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Um, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wanchuku Obi um, from Kenna Partners. So my question is, um, this is a beautiful presentation, by the way. So my question is, um, the Secured Transactions and Movable, Movable Assets Act of 2017, does it have a role to play with um, art as collateral for any transactions? Because I know the framework exists now. It's a 2017 act, but so far so good from your experience. Has it been used? And is it being used? And are there any things that could be done to make it better? So, excellent question. So, from my experience, um, it is not being used as it should be. Um, I, I know a team of people that are trying to set up an art fund last year uh, and did approach the Securities and Exchange Commission. And when they explained that the underlying asset was art, it, um, I understand there's an ongoing alternative funds. You know, there's, a paper, there's, a, there's another version of uh, the act that has been considered. And the thinking was, actually, why don't you guys come in and tell us a bit more about your fund so that we can actually augment into the regulation. So the guideline is not ready uh, 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 to be used. Um, but I think um, there's a two-way, it's a two-way thing here. I think uh, um, globally, um, not all financial markets, regardless of how mature they are, not all of them are actually able to understand how art can be used as an asset. So there's a two-way thing whereby the art community also needs to educate the regulator in terms of what they can adjust uh, to make this uh, a viable business. Thank you very much. That was very enlightening. Uh, like I said earlier, if we have any more questions, we can meet Mr. Balashiru after the conference. To give our next presentation on data-driven valuation, improving analysis, financial decision, and investment opportunities in the Nigerian art market is the next presenter, Mr. Tayo Fagune. Let's listen to his profile as he comes onto the stage. Tayo Fagune is a graduate of economics from the University of Lagos and holds an MBA from Lagos Business School for Atlantic University. He presently serves as the Chairman and Editorial Board at Business Day, where he leads content development strategy. He's over a decade-long experience in the media industry, includes top positions as Senior Manager at WNC Capital and Nigeria Correspondent for the Africa Report and Africa Confidential, where he wrote regularly on business, economics, and politics in Nigeria and West Africa. During this period, he was a member of the Editorial Board of Financial Derivatives Company, an investment research firm. Prior to his career in journalism, he was the MBA director at Lagos Business School, a role he combined with teaching anthropology and analysis of business problems on the full time MBA program. Fabulé, together with his Castellotti, has produced the Nigeria Art Market Report in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Tayo Fabulé. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, always being glad, always glad to be around um, people who love art. I think it's wonderful. Uh, most of what I know is just by being around people who love art, really. And um, as Bola mentioned, okay, and given my background, uh, Jess, saw, Jess and I saw a gap, and uh, we started the Nigerian art market. The title of my presentation is quite a mouthful, so I sort of reduced the 
sh uh, shortened it. Okay, so it's data-driven valuation, investing in the Nigerian art market. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about, I won't bore you with numbers. Uh, yes, I studied economics, I work in the business day, but I think it's more important to just talk generally. So first off is that, um, let's see. Okay, two beautiful ladies uh, from different generations, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, the, with them. Okay. Um, to, the, to the left is Billie Holiday, and to the right is Aretha Franklin. Why do I have these two pictures starting a presentation on data-driven valuation in the Nigerian art market? I'll explain as we go on. Um, Billie Holiday was discovered in 1931 by a gentleman called Paul Hammond, and then Arthur Franklin was, found, um, was discovered by the same gentleman about 30 years later. Um, he, Paul Hammond, I mean, he, lo he loved jazz, walks into a bar one day to see somebody else, and then there's this lady singing on the stage, and right there and there he knows she's going to be a success. His hunch tells him that, and he signs her, and we get Billie Holiday. Um, he goes through a peak, comes down, and then about 30 years later, he's listening to a band sing, and he dumps every band and just focuses on the voice of the lady singing, and the lady singing is Aretha Franklin, and that's how Aretha Franklin was discovered. So how do you spot talent? That's the whole idea, okay? Um, your intuition, your hunch, based on data, okay? Uh, okay, fine, I analyze it, and then I go for it. Or is it basically, okay, I know so, so I go for it. It's very difficult. Very difficult, how to spot talent. So, but a lot of data is driving a lot of decisions now, okay, from football stars, albums. So back then when Paul Harmon discovered um, Arthur Franklin and Billie Holiday, there was no Shazam, there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter with followings, Facebook, nothing. There was no, there, there, were no and there were not variables you could add together and say, you know what, this is a star in the future. He just used his hunch. He just knew it. And I'll tell you why, as I tell the story, why Paul Harmon was able to discover these two great women, these great artists. But the fact is that data-based decisions are the norms now. Watch any football match and you see behind those coaches, guys just crunching the data, crunching the data to just inform the decisions that the coach has to make in 90 minutes. But the fact is that data and hunch also have a limit. So data is good, okay, and it's fantastic, and hunch also, but also limited, both are limited. You have to, typically we are very, very confident, okay, fine, I know it's good, I go for it. But you also could also be wrong, because even data is based on assumptions. And past history, he sold for this amount, or he scored this number of goals, therefore he will. So you're assuming, so the assumptions. Why am I going through all of this? I'm supposed to talk about how data is driving the Nigerian art market and how you can make financial decisions. But I'm sort of putting a disclaimer, okay, that um, it takes more than just, okay, I have the data, so for instance, Jess and I, we come up with the Nigerian art market every year. Hopefully we'll try and do that for this year. And we just go through the art auctions for the year, prices of Nigerian art sold at auctions all over the world. And yeah, so that's data you can use. But some of these artworks originally were bought by people who just knew this is good art and I'm going to buy it. And they kept it. Many people who bought the Nwomus, who bought the Anachuis, who bought the Egonus, basically probably bought based on hunch. But now that there's data, both can be combined. That's what I'm trying to get at. So our hunches, our gut instincts can be educated. They can be educated. And then if they're educated, they can become very useful. So this gentleman says, if we use data intelligently, it gives an objective view, clearly. Okay, so last year, 
Tutu sold for 1.5. This year, Christian has sold for 1.4. So basically, you have an objective view, and then you just have a trend based on one artist, and you can tell. So you can tell someone's past performance based on um, data and the ability also for the future. But the fact is, the world is volatile. The past is not, and every financial expert will tell you, okay, that the past is not necessarily a predictor of the future. Which brings me to the art part now. So the art world is huge, okay? Um, so behind that number that was um, put against Christine a few days ago is this. The artists, the philosophers of art who will talk about the art. You have the cultural agents, the museums, the foundations, the galleries, the journalists, the dealers, the private collectors. All of that goes behind that single art that was sold a few days ago for that huge amount of money. And all of this, in one way or the other, inform that value that eventually was paid and eventually will be paid probably higher in the future for that work when it reappears, if it ever reappears again at auction. Now, I'll streamline it now further. So you could just break it down to like three. You have the galleries, you have the art fairs, you have the auction dealers, the investors, corporate collectors in between the artists, the private collectors, and then you have the cultural agents and journalists. So all of these have a role to play behind that one artwork, and I'll keep using that as an example. So when the artwork was made, eventually probably was shown at a gallery. Um, it was commissioned, as we know, by um, the husband of Christine, and probably was taken home. So probably this probably even never made it to a gallery, so just a private collector. So you have a, a, work, a piece of work on your wall, and you don't know who made it. But the only reason Christine has made it to the auction is because Tutu was sold. And Tutu was sold because somebody also discovered it but knew about it. And there's been a lot of writing about it. So galleries have been talking about it. Collectors have been wanting to have it. Art historians have been writing about the artist. There's a lot of documentation going around this singular artist. So basically, that is data as well. And of course, we have a history of um, the art market in Nigeria. 20 years ago, there was nothing. But some people got together and said, you know what, let's give this a try. And it started. And gradually, that data started. So you now had a different kind of data, the numbers. First, there was that discussion about the art. What is this artist saying? What is he trying to do? And then, eventually, it comes to auction. And those who understand what the artist is trying to do, what he's saying, OK, put a value to it, and they buy it. But then gradually, of course, that begins to build. So all of this goes to determining the data behind a single work of art. Then, of course, when it comes to selling it, you have the buyers and the sellers. Basically, the ones who move the art, the, the work of the artist from a studio to private collectors, corporate collectors, investors. So the art market is actually a very, very tiny part of the art world, but it's very important because it informs, it goes, the, so they're part of those tangible and intangible things that go into the valuation of a, a work of art. Yes, my remit is to talk about the numbers, but I think it would be unfair to just throw numbers at you without putting things in context. So there is a Nigerian art, there is an art market in Nigeria, and as I said earlier, I started about, well, in 1999 with the first auction, art auction. But why should anyone spend money on art? Why should I buy art? I imagine it's the same reason why the auction came up. People realized that, okay, well, I have these artworks and I can make a market for it. Typically, why do people sell their artworks? Either because they want to raise some fund for it or because they want to um, exchange the money that they have for it to buy some more, some other work. So you could come down to three reasons. 
I want to invest to increase my investment. I want to consume, okay? So I reduce or I buy, or I want to give it. I want to give my art away. As Bola mentioned also, it could, art is increasingly becoming an asset class and very popular as well among um, a certain class of people. But in, if you could stack them, as Bola did, obviously it's the least liquid of assets. It's very difficult to find. I mean, I can go out there with probably cash and I can exchange it for something else. I can go probably walk a bit further and walk into a bank and exchange my property for something. Um, I'll probably have to take a taxi and get to the stock exchange to convert my stocks and bonds into cash. But even if I went all the way with a taxi to the stock exchange, I'd hardly find a buyer for my work of art. That's how illiquid it is, just to give an example. Why is it difficult to sell art? Because first and foremost, people buy them to enjoy them. And I think it's important. Um, the reason why it was ever commissioned or the reason why it was ever made was because of the beauty it gave, it stood for, right? to make something beautiful. So, and that's the first thing that is probably attracts the buyer, the beauty, that emotional connection with the artwork. So people, say, okay, fine, I will invest to enjoy it. And some eventually sell, but some eventually also give their artworks away. To give an idea of the um, art market globally, uh, sorry, um, the investments in um, artworks by high network individuals. This is from 2014, I think. And we see the proportion that is um, devoted to art. So it's increasing, I mean, after luxury goods, People, more and more people are investing in art. There's a growing investment in art. But is art a good asset class for investment? Because at the end of the day, you want that data to make an investment decision. Should I buy? Should I sell? Should I keep? Should I give? Whatever is driving that decision, it's good to ask, is it a good asset class for investment? Even if the data is available, it's showing that it's increasing, increasingly being bought by people. So this is just um, an index comparing the S&P 500, the return on the S&P, and then the art market index and the price of gold. And you can see how um, the black line, this is over a period from 60s. It's, uh, it's called the Beautiful Asset. Um, it's called the, it's, I've forgotten what the index is called, but I think it's, bit, it's created by the Beautiful Asset Advisors. So every year they come out with an index just basically tracking um, artworks sold at auction. And obviously, art is doing very well. There's a trend. But still, what drives that investment is the emotion, which is why I started with the story of Paul Hammond discovering Arthur Franklin and Billie Holiday. It was hunch, great voice, she'll do well, let's go for her. He discovered other people, by the way, I just used those two people as, as, um, as examples. One of them won the Nobel Prize for Literature, imagine a musician, a few years ago. Uh, what's his name? Sorry, Bob Dylan, exactly. He discovered, and a Nigerian drummer as well. I've forgotten the gentleman's name. He's also discovered a Nigerian drummer. But this is just Paul Hammond from his interaction with jazz. So after school, Paul would just skip going home and go downtown. And then you just find one skinny chap in the stores, you know, a black neighborhood, just going through jazz records and listening, and just imbibing it, and just listening, and just enjoying it. So that the day he was there in that bar in February 1931, and he had Billy Holiday on stage, he knew that was the one. Now, for some people, they can do that in deciding to buy an artwork. 
to spot talent. Because the reasons why we are, the whole buzz about art now and as an investment, and it's yes, because the data is, is, we're getting more data, yes, and well, also these works are doing great in the market. And that, of course, that is what we hear, and they're like, okay, where is, is the next and one room? Who is the next and one room? How can I get my hands on the next and one room? That's what people are asking. That's what people are thinking because there's more data now. But where are we as a market compared to the world? We're a tiny, minuscule part of it. You can see China, South Africa. This is 2014. So, I mean, this, this just shows you we have a long way to go, just 20 years anyway. I mean, these, these art markets, except for China, have centuries behind them, centuries of. So yes, art has an, an economic value from the price, you can tell, and also a non-economic value. And I'll keep insisting on those two, the data and then your gut instinct or that ability to tell what is great art. Okay, so you're not swayed by the numbers. Because truth be told, and um, I'm sure um, when the history of those who lived, who were contemporaries of Benewon is further told, we will find other people also who you wonder, wow, what happened to him? What happened to her? How come she's not uh, making the same waves as Benewon is? They are. And yes, the experts will say um, fashion. Maybe things aligned for Ben. Maybe he told the story better. Or maybe he just came across someone who understood him and was able to really help him. I don't know, but of course he's there has to be talent, OK? So um, one economist that I respect very much, who's written a lot about the art market, says that, well, there are three ways you can, be, you can validate an artist. The first, you go to art school in the class. And like, we all went to school. We know who the best guy was, or the best who was top of the class. That's validation already. Oh, who's the brightest ch lady in the class? They all point in that direction. Whoa, OK, so we know who's the first class material. Very obvious. But the person just leaves school and goes to, say, um, work in a consulting firm. OK, who's likely to make partnership first? It's her. So another validation okay, from the peers. So in school, okay, you have your peers, and then of course, or she wins awards, okay? So she writes CFA exams, and she's top of the class. First, second, third, no receipts. I mean, this is A-class material. So that award she has won is also validation, okay? And that sort of adds value to the person. And then finally, obviously, then they go and they say, um, I don't know, some multinational is looking for a CEO. Who do we headhunt? Go for her. Because there's a track record, there's data. Validation in class, in school, first class, one TFA, awards back to back. She's worth that money and that salary. Let's pay her. So they've come to evaluation. What am I saying? Okay, that art has an economic value. And these are the things that come to determine the economic value of art. This validation from peers, from awards, from exhibitions, galleries, where you appear, who, who buys you, where you walk, who pays for you, who owns that work of art. All of this is what goes into that prize. So we could just summarize and say we could, the three Ps for collecting or investing in art. There's passion, there's prestige, and there's profit. Best collectors will tell you you know, I didn't buy it for the profit. But they'll tell you about the price. You know, I bought this work for X, um, maybe 50,000, 500,000 Naira 20 years ago. And I checked the last auction, and works of this particular person are going for 2.5 million, 5 million. They'll talk about it. OK, but the first thing that drove them was passion. And then, of course, now they can talk about profit because they know, they know how the market, the, the, the market prices to work. And then, of course, the prestige is that I own one, I have one. Well, 
which is why you could say, well, there's that attraction of showing that one belongs to the status fair. Yeah. I own one of those. I have one of those. Because it is a signal of, of, of culture, good taste, wealth, and connections. I'm not going heavy on, on numbers, if you, if you notice, because I, this is my own thesis, and um, I'm ready to have it shut down. And I'm, I'm, I'm testing waters. But the fact is that there's data, and there's God. There's passion, there's profit. And then, because all of this goes into valuation. So why does a person keep bidding on that night for that artwork? Is it because he thinks he can sell it next time? Or because I have to have this work? That's the passion. So maybe, maybe at one moment, it's pure numbers that's pushing him. I have the data. This is the trajectory. It's going to be um, in the next five years when I put it back on auction. Or, you know what? I just must have one of these artworks. So there are disadvantages. Let's be clear. And I'm not going to say, yes, you know, read the Nigerian art market report every year and you get a good, no, I'll be telling you a, a lie. Okay. There are disadvantages, okay, about, okay, investing in art. Some of them, um, Bola has mentioned, fakes, forgeries, okay. People say, gap, everybody likes this work, okay, fine, let's create more of it, a market for it, and you just have a market flooded with fakes and forgeries. So, the first thing is that art, unlike stocks, bonds, cash, and real estate, does not generate a stream of income. I can invest cash and then get an bonds, I get a percentage, an interest on it. But once I buy that piece of work of art, unless eventually we're able to come up with a huge, the ecosystem matures, and then we have, okay, fine, we can now find a way to collateralize and turn it into an asset class. But primarily, it does not generate a stream of income. In other words, art is a liquid. The market is opaque. So all the data we have for the Nigerian art market is from auctions from 1999 till date in Lagos, London, Paris, these are the big markets for art from Africa. And a bulk of that, a good chunk of that, are Nigerian artists. So there's not a shortage of works in the market, Nigerian art, um, um, works by Nigerian artists, and is, is growing, and is going to continue to grow as people start to look for other, explore. So as people's tastes also mature, and I, maybe I should just talk about taste here and fashion. Um, so first, you're going to collect art that you're familiar with, okay? Um, it represents something that I see, well, depending on your background as well, okay? Um, but you probably buy something that you, you like, you're familiar with, I, I recognize this, I understand this. And then your taste begin to, it begins to mature. You, you're, you're meeting other collectors, you're, you're going to galleries, you're meeting gallery owners, attending events, and, and you're reading more, attending art fairs. So your taste begins to mature, and you say, I want something more. You, you begin to cross boundaries. And we're saying that already in, in Nigeria, so many more collectors are going for outside Nigeria, across the Bene border. Thank God the closure of the border doesn't affect that, but a lot of Nigerians buying art from Bene and West Africa, and then also from um, East Africa as well. And the same thing is happening to these big collectors in the West also. And we can see that already with um, the works of um, Inji Deka. And that's that exploration of art from elsewhere. It's growing. So eventually they will start discovering, well, okay, where's Inji Deka from? Okay, she's Nigerian, okay, fine, let's go look for. So it's going to happen as stays um, mature. But it's a liquid, it's opaque, it's unregulated. This has also disadvantages. Um, Bola said, where can you find someone who can store that work for you? Because of, so you have some people who also say, you know what, I'm going to buy, and I'm going to buy deep. 
I'm going to just focus on works in paper by a particular artist. I know a good um, the story of a gentleman who just bought um, Picasso's. No, was it Picasso's? Either Picasso's or Impressionists, but their paper works. And the paper is very, very delicate, brittle. So the the art the, the, the it, it could get burnt, it could it could it could um, mold. M mold could grow on it. So you have to there's a temperature and all of these things you have. To, so that that comes with the cost. You have to insure it, um, it's quite, and um, that takes knowledge and people willing to take that risk to insure. Um, documentation is very important. So provenance. A work is sitting on your wall, or you got, but you don't know um, its origins. Uh, to take an example, okay, the only reason, well, among other things, Christine was sold a few days ago was because well, there's a growing provenance about uh, knowledge about Enwomo's works. That helps a lot. And then, of course, the transaction costs are very high. But the advantages, it's not all bad news. A good store of value, a very good store of value. So by the time you start buying a particular artwork from a particular artist, and each year you go to... Now, so another thing that I didn't mention about artworks, that's um, an advantage and a disadvantage is that they're, they're not homogeneous. They're not, an artwork is not a commodity. It's unique, and no two artworks are the same. No two works, artworks are the same, so it's not a commodity. So that is, and that's as a, is an advantage because then it's a good store of values. I am the only one with this copy, well, with this artwork by this artist from this period. And if a lot of value is attached to works from that period by this artist, then it's a good store of value because it will continue to gain in capital in, in value. Okay, so just uh, to, round, to round up, just show you some of the data we gathered for um, the last art market report. Um, uh, and, well, the, the latest art market report is not yet out, but these, these are the things we've gathered. Uh, 42 Nigerian artists, 132 artworks, all of which generated $7 million last year. Of this, uh, this is 94% of all Nigerian artworks sold at 2018 auctions. So. 42 Nigerian artists, 132 artworks. And we're having an increase in the number of auctions as well. We're seeing an increase in the number of art auctions dedicated to works from um, Africa. Um, when, we, when Jess and I started putting the data together, I think there was, there was just um, Art House. Um, Terraculture, My Dream Gallery, and I think Bonham's. Yes. And, but that was 99, and then today we have 11. And some hold two to three a year. So all of this is, so maybe um, one auction, for instance, London, in Lagos you have five auctions. Of course, we know there are um, just two really, yeah, three, okay. Sorry, three. You have Sogal, you have um, Art house and you have TKMG. So between them, they had five auctions last year. Uh, three in London and then three in Paris. Of, in total, you had 32 Nigerian artworks were sold. Of course, some are repeated. Um, a, a, a big, 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 um, um, you could say, um, and one was the bellwether. And so just in volumes and in price, just the bellwether is it. What I mean, so he influences prices and impress, impresses, uh, inf influences volumes. So sales were 7.1 in all of this, 29%. So there's an appreciation. It's growing. People are getting to know more about the art market. There's interest, they're bidding. I must get one of them. People are getting more educated. The art fairs are helping. So many people at, the art, at art X in the past two years, there's the first contact with art, but then that love happens. Love at first sight or they get to know about it. I want to know more. 
you have um, affordable art auctions for those who don't have um, big po deep, deep pockets. You have relay between a lot of promoting young artists. So the, 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 the ecosystem is growing and it's generating data. But this data is a thin, 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 I think thing is even um, pushing it. It's um, almost like it's as thin as my, my hair. So all this data I'm giving is just, it's, it's, it's um, a sliver is the word I was looking for. It's a sliver of all of the information available about artworks. Because m the best art collections in Nigeria, believe me, are in private hands. And that was because, obviously, there was a, if you the history of, um, the art market, um, of the art market in Nigeria was the, in the early 60s, 50s, okay, when the likes of Enwamu already was um, exhibiting as a, an 18-year-old, or even no secondary school student, actually, was, was uh, his first exhibition. So there are already art ex exhibitions back then in the 50s. And then, but a lot, uh, well, so people would say the mili military era really um, dis disrupted a lot of things. So those, the writing, the discourse, the exhibitions um, sort of dwindled. And of course, when a work is not visible, is not seen, then you cannot, um, then it can't be appreciated, then you can't spark that passion, you can't start that debate, that discourse. That, so that happened for a while, but now we're, we're, we're there's a, there's a blossom in all over again. And as I mentioned, one artist to rule them all uh, from the Lord of the Rings. And it's no surprise. It's no surprise. Based on just that data and hunch that I started with. So whoever discovered, whoever saw his works as a secondary school student, I said, this is a great talent, and said, you deserve an exhibition. You should go to London, saw so talent. And then just built a career. But there was talent, just like Billie Holiday was definitely talented, but he just needed that connection with Paul Hammond. Arisa Franklin was there in the background singing, and Paul Hammond could tell beyond all the noise, the music, that this is the talent. Um, so 44, 46 of arts works were sold tw last year, uh, 39 of them in London, 7 in Lagos. In total, um, his works generated 4.5, well, $5 million. So 92% more than the previous year and practically half of what was sold last year. So is the, ma is the market the best judge of value in the uh, best judge of value? Remember I said all this information is basically a sliver of information about uh, private deals going on, as sold in galleries. So it's still, it's, still that, it's still a debate, but the fact is that there's information and there's market making, which is very important. It, it creates transparency. So that handshake that happens when the, the hammer goes down on an artwork, okay, is creating history. And then you can either discount up or down, sorry, you can either discount downwards or add upwards to say, okay, fine, this is the value of this work. But there is data, and, and thanks to the, um, to the auctions, they've, they've done a good deal. So they are, to an extent, a great help. So still back to um, the story about the data and the hunch. Okay, there's asymmetry of knowledge in the art market. Okay, so the person who's selling it or the person who owns it or the person who's going to buy it probably knows so much and is willing to pay so much if you can get a good deal. So knowledge in the art market is power. A knowledge of data, yes, and analyzing that data, getting comfortable with the artworks, understanding the artworks is very critical. So why is Warren Buffett one of the successful investors in the um, stock, make, stock market? He didn't take lucky picks. He didn't make lucky bets. He did his homework. He does his homework. He keeps doing his homework. Warren Buffett will tell you here, and Charlie Munger will read, I don't know, 100 plus um, pages every day to, de to, uh, to decide where to allocate assets. And he will give you clearly why he invests 
and, and wh why he invests and in what. He has an investment policy and it's not failed him. So the amount of effort you need to buy a stock or a company, also you need to put into buying um, a piece of work. So to invest successfully in the art market requires a good understanding of the art world. Don't be swayed by the numbers. Don't be swayed by your passion. Both you have to educate, both have to educate each, each other. And my part, parting shot will be from Charles Sachi, who has done a, who understood the art world and really called, has cost a lot of, um, when, when history is told about the art market in the West, I mean, Charles Sachi will probably, I'm sorry, Charles Sachi will be mentioned. But his advice is just buy something you really like that will give you a thousand of pounds worth of pleasure over the years and take your time looking for something really special because looking is half the fun. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We'll take three from, from the front, middle, and back. Um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Ayo. I'm an artist. Um, I would want to disagree with you on the orange part, but then I'm going to try not to be too artistic about my disagreement. Uh, well, <laughs> Is a business firm, um, but I agree with you on the the art, the market um, sector, segment. So when you look at Lagos and try to imagine there's a pendulum, uh, you you figure out that there's a lot of activities on there's a lot of weight on the art market, uh, in the sense that um, the two biggest events is the auction and the fair. Uh, so what happens is um, the other side of the the, the swing is um, kind of like lacking, which is very much responsible for the data that is needed in the art market. Um, so I'm quite curious, how have you been able to navigate uh, the data you've been collecting? Uh, and then how has it been able to weave through the primary and the secondary markets? Because in Lagos, it's very blurry what is secondary, what is primary. And um, you can't actually talk about what is primary anyways. Uh, so um, I'm very curious to know that. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm glad you disagree and, on, about the hunch. And we can always discuss that. But um, yes, yeah, so the journey of an artwork from the studio to auction is in the West is more or less um, structured. So the artist does the work. Um, he finds a gallery to represent him, who presents the work, and then there's someone who buys the work for the first time, or, and then um, eventually, some years later, the work appears um, at auction. I don't know how long Inji Deka has been painting, but um, that journey, even in the West, is getting shorter. Okay, you discover the artists, um, has a gallery representative, has shows and exhibitions, and then that collector, some years later, buy, sells that work. But because of, um, of course, we're in a world where data is also very easily available, information is very easily available, so obviously um, that journey, is, that cycle is um, shorter. In Nigeria, okay, um, it's, it's blurred, okay? We do have a secondary market established, the art, the art auctions, but do we have a secondary market, and do we have a primary market? Um, it's debatable, so, okay, fine. Um, the argument I give is um, India first started with services, IT, to grow the economy, now they're going into manufacturing, but typically in the West, you start with manufacturing and then you go to services. So maybe what we're gonna have here is, okay, fine, we're gonna have the art auctions establish Okay, if I, hey guys, there is a market, and then the art fair realizes, okay, to increase knowledge, let's have more events. So the market here is going backwards, in my view. Okay, so must it be in the order of primary second to secondary? Well, I don't know, but that's my view, that's my take. Do we have any more questions? Thank you very much. If there are any more, anyone comes up.
school meeting. Thank you, Mr. Fagunle. That was, yeah. So to carry on, we're going to have a recap of the Point of View series of talks. We're going to have a video that will give us a recap of the Point of View series of talks, the previous edition, which was titled A Case for, an artist, for the Artist's Resale Rights. Thank you. My name is Oliver Nwongu, and I'm Executive Director of the Benewo Foundation, which was established in 2003 in honor of Africa's greatest artist. Today's event is the first in a series of talks that show how relevant art is to society. It's going to be monthly and it's also in partnership with Allianz Frances Lagos and Mike Adenuga Center in Lagos. And we're going to be bringing all sorts of speakers you know, from all walks of life to talk about art in shaping society. It's aimed at professional artist development, it's aimed at empowering the artist, it's aimed at bringing the public and private sectors together in support of the visual arts in Nigeria. That was the previous edition. It was a success. Just a quick reminder that we are streaming live on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Our Instagram handle is at Benenomu Foundation. Facebook and YouTube IDs are at the Benenomu Foundation. We can please use the hashtag POV Point of View, the Benenomu Foundation, to make comments and interact with us on our social media pages. Thank you very much. Up next is the panel discussion on challenges, risks, and regulatory frameworks. To lead that discourse is Mr. Dakpo Adeniyi. Dakpo Adeniyi is the publisher, position magazine, and film director, back page productions. He began his career in radio and television when his first play was broadcast in BBC World Service in 1986. In 1984, he became a British Council Fellow in Downing College, University of Cambridge. Subsequently, Adeni was appointed by the Nigerian Television Authority to write the television adaptation of Olesho Inka's childhood memoirs, Ake, which he eventually adapted for film and directed and screened in Lagos and Cannes in 2016. Dakwa Adeni is a prominent name in Nigerian literature and journalism and has translated indigenous literature to English, as well as served as editor for Arts and Culture for the Nigerian Times. He has also served as a visiting editor. He has also served as a visiting editor to the Times Literary Supplement of London. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause as I welcome Mr. Dakwa Adeni to moderate the panel discussion. Hello. Okay, I say hello and welcome to every one of us. Um, it's the first time I had so much said about me. Uh, and, you know, it feels very good. So, <laughs> um, we have the information on our hands, and I'm told that we're going to have some kind of citation on some, some of the people who are coming to talk. And uh, I must say that much of what we're going to do will be more anecdotal in the sense that uh, so much has been laid out both by Tayo and by Bola. But I believe that those who are coming are very big wigs, there are people who are, who are involved with auctions, with buying, with selling, people who know business. So I'm going to invite them, and I'm told that something's going to be said on them. Are we still going to show something on, on them? Okay. So I want to invite Professor Konisola Ajayi, S-A-N, is the managing partner of Olani Nwu Ajayi LP. So let's just put our hands together as it comes. Is he here? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, he'll okay. be represented by. He'll be represented by Ifrim Machijola, who is an expert on entertainment, leisure, and intellectual property at Olani Muajai LP. You're welcome. Thank you. Then. Um, I'll be inviting Omoba Yemisi Adedoin Shilon, who I believe is not a small name at all in the business. It's actually an Iroko. So I invite Prince and Omoba Yemisi Shilon to come over. 
You're welcome, sir. Is there a legal practitioner and chapter member and fellow of several professional bodies, including the Institute of Marketing, Directors, Management, and Stockbrokers, and the Body of Engineers. Shilon earned a bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Ibadan, in law from the University of Lagos, and an MBA from Obakami Aulo University. In addition, he holds a honorary doctor of letters degree from the University of Otakot. He has served as executive director of Nigeria Limited, chairman of Ogun State Radio and Television Station, Ogun State Investment Corporation, and Gateway Tourism Corporation. Omar Bayi and Mrs. Shilon has established Nigeria's first privately funded public museum at the Pan Atlantic University in Lagos. He is globally acknowledged to hold the largest art collection in Nigeria, with well over 7,000 artworks, as well as over 55,000 photographs. Today, his foundation continues to sponsor fellows and artists from around the world to work in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me as I welcome Prince Yenisi and the Doyen Shilon to the panel. Thank you. Next, I'm, uh, I'm going to invite Mrs. Kavita Chalaram. She's the Chief Executive Officer for Art House. And uh, Art House, obviously, is the biggest, I hope, um, auction house, maybe in Africa. You're welcome. which has a focus on modern and contemporary art from West Africa. She has also established Art House Foundation to provoke discourse on contemporary art in Nigeria through residences for artists. An avid art collector, Chilaram was inspired to set up an auction platform in Nigeria to provide transparency in pricing and structure on the domestic art market. Since 2008, Art House has held annual auctions in Lagos Achieving record sales in Nigeria for pioneer modernists, including Ben Ewo, Bruce Onokwakweya, Abade Glova, Isu Guilo, and Isho Keke. Kavta Chelaram is a trustee of the Prince's School of Traditional Art and a member of the African Acquisition Art Fund of Tate Modern in the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as I welcome Kavta Chelaram to the panel. Thank you. Uh, last but not least is uh, Mr. I hope, if not Chief, John Opubo. Um, he's the managing partner of Coronation Capital. You're welcome, sir. John Okubo holds a BA in Economics from Columbia University and has enjoyed a 20-year career as a principal investor and investment banker in developed emerging and frontier markets. He is presently the managing partner of Coronation Capital, where he leads deal sourcing and execution across financial services, technology, and consumer goods and services. He also works on secondary buyout initiatives, acting as principal advisor on transactions in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa. As an investment banker, Okubo has held senior positions at Actors in Lagos, Nigeria, and Credit Suisse in New York, as well as worked at Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, and Provenda Capital Group. He currently serves as the president of the Columbia University Club of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome John Okubo. So I would like to welcome all our uh, very big uh, names and hands. And uh, what I find very exciting, you know, is that much of what we we'll have really wanted to say, you know, there's a lot of, lot of grounding, you know, in the presentation, especially by Bola and also by Tayo. But I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell us what you think, what you have seen, what you have felt. Uh, because um, we can project, we can see all, kind, all kinds of things, but you have been there. Um, Oboba Yabisi Shilon is the biggest buyer. Uh, people have been talking about people who buy from auction houses, people buy by relating directly with artists. So there's a lot you know, that you can say. 
Uh, the first uh, question, uh, which I just want to throw up, has to do with raising capital. So we've had so much about collateralization of art, about uh, liquidating and all that. Um, is it feasible for you? Uh, I want to start with um, Omoba Shilon. Um, you know, with what we have seen, you know, I mean, some concerns were raised. We know there are challenges, there are issues, there are opportunities. Some of them are mouth watering, you know, but for you, you know, um, what's happening? How big is it? Sorry. Can we, you know, let's share out the mics. Are they working? Okay. Well, in answering that question, we have to first of all look at the regulatory framework, like Bola Ashiru mentioned. Um, the regulatory framework is um, yet opaque. Uh, we have the Central Bank Regist Registration uh, Regulation, 2014. We also have the Banking and Financial Institutions Act of 1991. We have the Securities and Exchange Commission Act. Um, all these acts specify the management in, and also investment in movable and immovable assets in Nigeria. However, given the fact that the art market in Nigeria is in its infancy, and the regulators themselves need to know more about how they can make the laws as they are today apply to, um, to, to make art grow as it should grow. So we have a lot to, to do, like it was mentioned by Bola. We have a lot to do to, um, to assist the regulators to make it feasible. For instance, the Central Bank is um, empowered under the um, uh, regist re registration of uh, assets under the Central Bank regulation of um, 2014 to open a register, operate the register, and maintain a register of um, you know, art as a collateral. Unfortunately, that regist register, to the best of my knowledge, is not operating. And if you don't have a register where you can uh, ensure that the mortgage go does not go punished by lending his uh, money to a mortgagee and um, does, cannot, have a, cannot recover his uh, money, then you have a problem. So we've got to look at the regulatory, uh, regulatory framework. That is the first thing. Secondly, there is a debt of data out there. Um, a lot of data has been bundled around this afternoon about, um, you know, that, that have been collected through the um, auction houses and so on and so forth. And somebody wrongly said that the primary market does not exist in Nigeria. It does exist in Nigeria. The only problem is that the primary market is not, does not give data. They, nobody knows how to collect the data. The primary market is made up of artists producing the artwork and selling directly to consumers, collectors, and so on and so forth. Um, this, there is no way to capture this data. Um, it is good that the art house, uh, the Bonhams, and so on and so forth have data. They publish brochures, and uh, of course, you go there. You can pick data like Jess Castellotti has been doing, uh, the Bonhams auction house, the Phillips auction house, the Sudeby auction house. They give data. But you don't know what is happening with the primary market. And the primary market is a very big market that is not captured. And so we need to be able to gather data that can assist um, investors in being able to take informed decision. Because the problem with investment is that you have to have informed decision. You cannot, you, you have to take informed decision. You cannot take decisions in abstraction and expect to achieve positive results. You'll be taking too much risk. That is the second problem. The third problem is that the market itself, even though it's, it's not only opaque, but um, uh, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of risk involved in terms of how do you validate the loan value ratio of artwork. Because when people want to lend out um, money um, using art as collateral, they have to determine the, low, the loan value ratio. The loan value ratio is a very important ratio in the sense that you cannot, the loan value ratio, for instance, is defined as just the, 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 the value of the artwork divided by the loan you want to give. 
You cannot, usually you cannot. Even in America, they don't give um, any, any uh, loan more than 50% of the L LVR because it's, it's, very, it's a very risky uh, um, asset itself, you know, because a lot of things can happen. You can burn, you, there can be fire, I mean, there can be water, there can be anything. So they don't give more than 50% if you, if you find out. So that is very important. The LVR, we don't have any way to determine this. And we need to sit down as um, uh, stakeholders in this industry to help the regulators, to help the market to, to determine uh, the L LVR. And then finally, it's very important, like Bola Ashiru mentioned, uh, liquidity. And of course, I think the last speaker also mentioned it. The problem of liquidity. You see, you, you, buy, you, you give loan out to <laughs> a mortgagee, and if the man defaults, how do you convert your artwork into? You want the money immediately. You don't want to wait you know, a long time uh, to get, to get uh, the asset um, you know, sold. So that's a very Im important uh, factor. So there are many, many uh, factors involved. We are still far from, from what we're dreaming about, but we need to do a lot of work. A lot of um, you know, uh, facts and data have been given out um, during this presentation. And there are much, many more, so I want to give others room to talk. Yeah, um, Thank you. I was actually going to um, lead us in the direction of those who have corporate collections. Um, I know that uh, the Ajayi company you know, has a quite a tranche of uh, visual arts. And uh, I, I think I saw a collection. I saw some kind of a book in which the works that you have. So um, banks already have a lot of works in their keeping, uh, corporate organizations, even government sometimes. So can we hear from you? You know, I mean, have you actually, you know, thought this over? Have you had the experience of want, wanting to actually collateralize or to use what you have? You know? um, thank you so much. Uh, first, let me say that uh, Professor Ajayi, who is the managing partner of Alanu Ajayi, was actually here. Uh, he's so very passionate about art collection, but he had to just step out for an emergency. So. I apologize on his behalf, and I have to thank you and the organizers for affording him this opportunity to speak. I hope I can step properly in his shoes. Thank you for the question. Um, the, we've come across a number of issues uh, in relation to arts um, over the years in our practice, about five years ago. Now, Companies and Allied Matters Act, for example, allows you to pay for cash or to take up shares in a, con in a company uh, for considerations other than cash. So we've been in a position where someone has uh, approached us on, oh, okay, I, there's a company, I, I'm interested in investing in this company and um, I, I think that I can, instead of giving cash, I can give my work of heart. Now, so we believe it was possible because it is not disallowed under the law. And so, but then certain other considerations came in. How do you, guarantee the uh, authenticity of the art and then valuation. And like you mentioned, volatility. So because the law requires that, oh, you don't just put your work of art and say, oh, this is Ben Enwo's tutu. I'm giving it and I'm taking a hundred unit of shares in your company. Someone has to value it. Now, so, but because of the fickleness or volatility of the arts market, even if you had said, oh, tutu today is 1.2 billion, uh, $1.2 million, and then you want to take up shares, say, for example, in Google. There are certain things that may make the uh, company not give you up to 100 for Tutu that is worth 1 billion. Now, so you're thinking, oh, Tutu is doing well in the market right now, but we don't know what will happen in the next 10 years. Or we may not even be able to guarantee that you have proper title to Tutu right now. Now, so take it back. Um, Bola talked about certain things about property. So when you, go, when you want to take uh, security over this building, oh, you know, it is here, you check the registry, this person owns it, okay, or maybe it's been mortgaged or this person has a charge over it. Now those records you don't have about that hat. Now so anyone who's giving you shares, for example, in relation to, and, and taking hats as consideration, will take all of these things and think, okay, I don't really know the status of these things. So instead of giving you 100, he says, okay, because of the risk, I'll give you 50, 50 units as against 100, just like he said. Now, so those are some issues. However, we are also then aware that 
there is a law, Secured uh, Assets, uh, Movable Assets uh, Act of 2017, allows you, now it mentioned a number, it creates a registry for properties that have been used for mortgage transactions and other movable asset transactions. It doesn't prohibit HAT, so it means HAT is allowed. However, the challenge again is that that act requires that a register of assets be made, but we are not aware if that uh, register is being maintained. At the very least, what the register would have done is to, even if it doesn't verify authenticity or valuation, it will give you a little bit of tra a, a traction about what is there and what, what we don't have that. So what we've typically advised clients is, well, we would do normal valuation. We would, that, and that is assuming that the authenticity has been guaranteed. I mean, if it's an EBMO, you've looked at the signature, you've probably checked with the EBMO Foundation to ascertain the authenticity. Let's assume we've passed all of that because all of those things come also into valuation. Then we then advise the uh, uh, entity taking shares, and I'm particular about this taking shares, then the issue of, okay, where do we deposit it in this comes in? Now, so when, for example, we may call for capital and then you're unable to make it, what happens? And then say we deposit with it with art house, we order art house to sell, and then we're not, on, we're not able to make immediate cash when we have a cash call. Now, those are the little issues. But on the whole, we've seen companies, especially new companies, let me use the word new age companies, who are willing to then take art, however, on a very low power level as, um, as consideration for shares in those countries in uh, for their company. Now, when we then talk about uh, funding, lending, and other funds, that applies as well. Only that it reduces. It is not a non-recourse. So, if I'm giving you 50 million naira or 100 million naira for Tutu, uh, I'm saying well. When I would have taken okay, just the alliance from said building for the old 50 million and everything is fine. I'll say, well, you give me two, two, but you may have to give me maybe your car. You know, it is not a non recourse. It's, and this speaks to the fact that there is low confidence or the volatility, all of these issues play into what you call the bankability of the asset that is being put in front for, for assets. But to be honest, I think in the last two, three years, the body language, the perception to hearts being taken for security or even for shares has improved a little improved. bit, and uh, clients are willing to take those things as consideration or uh, for funding. Thank you. Um, we want to come to Mrs. Uh, Chelaran, and uh, you can see that a lot of things are coming your way. Uh, when people want to actually um, li liquidate, you know, they are thinking of you. Uh, when somebody wants to, you know, somebody has something, wants to check, he wants to buy, he's thinking of you, please help us check. So what do you do when a work shows up you know, uh, either for the auction. I also want to extend uh, uh, to say that uh, sometimes in uh, keeping what you have, what have you done? Tell us, you know, because you have a lot to say. Um, when we started Art House Contemporary, actually, there was no secondary market. There was nowhere where you could actually go and ask how much your work cost. And what the auction did over here was actually create a secondary market. Um, and so then you realize that, yes, my work had value. There were artists that were put up that were known to this country, um, which was not public knowledge. Uh, when I first started off buying, in fact, you know, we had artists coming, and Engineer Shilon knows, uh, in the back of their cars, they had their works, and they would just sell the works and go. There was hardly any gallery representation. And what this did, it was sort of a catalyst effect where we then were able to document and uh, give people a true value of the, of the work because it was sold in auction, in a public auction. We then actually um, gave it to the press, so it was public knowledge. And um, the art fairs now are doing that too. So when you're selling works at art fairs, you're also getting public knowledge. Well, the, well, the press is getting public knowledge of what works are selling at. So it's not only the modern uh, works that we sold that we sold, but it's also the art fairs that are now giving us a lot of information of, of, of what people are wanting to buy and the trends. And then eventually they come to us. We are now the secondary market, um, no longer the primary, and uh, where they're now able to sell their works and get value for it. What we also do is documentation and we also do provenance. That's really important because right now 
as values have gone up for works of art, we're getting a lot of um, works which are forgeries, we have to check. So we have a team of experts that actually help us check works. We take provenance, it's very important from where the work has come down, where did the person acquire it, how was it acquired. Uh, for example, Ben and Wanu is no longer um, alive and we have the foundation over here, the Ben and Wanu Foundation that helps us hugely in uh, being able to authentic authenticate the works of Ben and Wanwo, and also many of the other modern artists. So it's been a great um, privilege to be here. Uh, I was a collector, and my love for African art has taken me to this position. Thank you. Before we actually leave you, uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, um, you mentioned a little bit, you know, of what you do, uh, apart from the actual auction. I just want you to throw more light. I'm sure a lot is happening. I remember there was a case in which some works were brought and you found that some of them were actually fake. I know that you call the law, you call the police, what do you do, what did you do? I mean, I think it's more interesting to hear what has actually happened, you know. Well, actually we tell the, but we ask the person um, how they got it. We had an artist actually who's actually suing someone uh, six works of his were brought in, and uh, luckily the artist is alive. So we called him in and asked him, are these genuine works? And he said, no, they're fakes, and where did they come from? So we then had to go into this court case where, we, where he sued us with the person who brought the works in, so that he could hope that we could hold on to the works. Otherwise, we have no right to. You know, the the person who consigns them can come in and say, "I've ch I've changed my mind, and I don't want to sell them, and I want to take them back." This way, it we we were obliged to keep them for the artist, and then the case went through, and then he took us off because now we no longer were, you know, liable for the works. And they are now in the court judgment, waiting to be judged about what's going to happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, very quickly, let's come to uh, John. The issue of valuation. Um, what actually comes to my mind is, um, well, this is the value of this work, you know, but somebody's actually offering me. He wants to take a private, you know, a private person, you know, wants to take a loan, and he comes to me. Uh, you know, how do I value? You know, I'm not a bank, I'm not a big name, you know, I don't have a big capital or something. You know, so what do I do? <clears throat> That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll start out by saying that um, I, I spend my professional life in the capital markets, uh, both liquid and e-liquid, primarily e-liquid now in the alternative space, which is private equity. And, um, you know, I don't deal specifically with art, but I do, I do deal with alternatives. And, and one of the key issues there is finding ways to value assets, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, generally the way you would do that is you'll try to understand what the income stream is for a certain asset. Um, the other way you might try to do that is to see what other derivative value you can generate from it. So I think art does, uh, art is a challenging one in, in that respect. I think others have been saying that because it, it doesn't generate those sorts of streams necessarily. It can if you're licensing something, um, but it doesn't necessarily generate those cash streams. And, and I think um, you know, the other thing that you see is um, uh, when the professor was talking about loan to value ratios, right? So if you own an asset, what are you able to actually take out of that asset? Um, and that sort of dictates what the yields are on the asset as well, right? So if you have an investment decision and you're going to buy one thing that's worth 100 million Naira, right? Um, what do you get for that 100 million Naira? And so I think that's when you start to see the connection between art as a tradable asset and art as something that you just appreciate and you have a passion for. And I think that's where um, there is a challenge but also a real opportunity in the art space. So, you know, the way you would generally um, uh, value most assets is you would get comparables. I think we've talked about that extensively, that's data. Uh, you would see where those assets were trading. Um, that's very clearly what you'd see at auction, for example. 
um, and you start to build enough of that um, sort of track record, understanding of the data, understanding of the provenance of it, uh, and then from that perspective, you start to say, I believe it's worth X. But the truth is, at the end of the day, something is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So if you own an asset, um, irrespective of what you think it is, uh, how much it's, it's valued at, if a third party is not willing to pay you that much for that asset, it's not worth that. That's what markets are for. Markets actually um, are where you test price and where price discovery occurs. And ultimately, that's where it happens. Uh, what's actually coming to my mind has to do with the government. You know, um, is there any role that, I want to come to Moba Shilon again, is there any role that the government can play, like a national gallery, for example, if there's a fund where the proven value of a work of art you know, is known, and that somebody actually wants to you know, turn what he has into money. And uh, you know, I mean, do you think there's a possibility that we can actually end up in a direction like that? Well, let me add to the point he just raised. Valuation is very important in this topic. Uh, valuing artwork is uh, not a uh, small thing. It's, it's an industry by itself. There are um, artwork appraisers in the world, in the advanced world, who will take, if you take a work to A, an appraiser, Mr. A, and you take it to an appraiser, Mr. B, and Mr. C, you find that there will be very little variation in the appraisal of the artwork. And these are people that are trained uh, from not only being art historians to start with, uh, but they have been trained in terms of exposure, how to identify. They are also trained to identify forgeries and so on and so forth. And uh, they are usually, some of them are usually um, auctioneers who have practiced as auctioneers and had a direct contact with some of these works. So the great art houses like Sudeby and uh, Christie have art appraisers who give value to art. And they, they give this value based on historical perspective too. For instance, a Benny one would have sold in the year 2000 of about this style, this uh, medium is very important, uh, and so on and so on. And it's a Benny one they will be able to place it side by side with what is before them and put a Q value to it. The Q value will be the multiplicant to determine whether that the work in the year 2019, of the same style, of the same size, and so on and so forth, you know, um, with the same makeup, concept, passion, universality, timelessness, and all these elements, composition, design, you know, they put all that into, into place and then multiply by a Q factor to determine the, the price of artwork. Of course, you also have the labor technique of determining the price of artwork. The labor technique in terms of an artist that doesn't have a name, how do you appraise his work? Because you're talking about secondary market based on somebody who has a name, like Benny Wong and Co. But what of the artist who does not have a name, who is doing a very good work? Then you have to now go to the history of the artist, find out about his peer group, you look at his style, you look at the promise he has to offer, and so on and so on. You place him along artists of his type at a particular time and then position him to determine the price of artwork. So it's a very technical point. It's a technical issue. It's not something you, um, you take for granted because it's, it's, the, it's the fulcrum of the success of art market. Now going back to National Gallery of Art. Yeah, but, but before you actually move on, <coughs> yes. um, he said something earlier on about the value of, an, you know, of a piece. If Certainly, a work goes that is actually worth maybe eight naira. You know, um, the person who is selling at some point has been compelled to sell for three. You know, and that tends to affect the value because a new benchmark is actually set. No. Thereby. No. You know, because that's what's really happening um, when an artist is selling direct, uh, directly <laughs> to a collector, and uh, somebody says, "This is how much you know I'm going to pay." No. He haggles. He sells, and the same person no, comes back and no. says, there is, a basic rule. Okay. <laughs> there is a basic rule that affects that. The basic rule, like in many assets in the world, is willing buyer and willing seller. That is the underlying factor. But I'm talking yeah. about a case where somebody is actually compelled. That's what I'm saying. Go. I say yes. willing buyer and okay. willing seller. The element okay. of compel compulsion has already been taken care of. Yeah. I mean, when you have a situation where a willing buyer, very willing to buy, 
and somebody very unwilling to sell, what happens to price? It goes up. It goes up. And when you have a situation where somebody is very willing to sell and somebody is very unwilling to buy, what happens to price? It comes down. I mean, that's it. It's, it's a simple rule in, um, to govern what you just talked about. So um, let's go back to National Gallery of Art. <laughs> the, National, the National Gallery of Art was not established for the purpose of you know, um, funding art. It was established to store art, preserve art, conserve art. Well, I don't, I, the government, government did not set it up for the purpose of, I think the people that have the money to do it, uh, Kavita, you know. <laughs> you know, they didn't set up the National Gallery. So we shouldn't begin to assign responsibilities that are no, not no, there. I was actually assuming, you know, yeah. because the National Gallery actually has a tranche. They have a number of works they buy. They don't resell. Really you know, I'm just saying that from the perspective of law, I mean, if a law is made, if a certain framework is actually set, you know, I'm just saying that is it possible? I'm not saying it's happening. Yes. I'm not saying it has to happen. No, their job okay. is to build a museum, I mean, a, a, a gallery, like you have in other developed parts of the world, and position this artwork for people to come and enjoy. Like, all of us here have seen different galleries in the world that is, um, you know, um, put together by government agencies. And you go there, you see it. I mean, look at the Tate Gallery. I mean, look at the National Portrait Gallery in London. I mean, it's a state, it's a state uh, uh, preserver of art. Look at the Stuttgart Museum in, uh, in Germany. Look at the, um, the, the, the National Museum in, in uh, Brasilia, and so on and so forth. These are uh, muse uh, museums or galleries set up by government to preserve and showcase and promote the creativity of their people and also promote their image as a national entity. It's not, they, we didn't set up the National Gallery. Look at the act setting up the gallery of, uh, National Gallery of Art. It doesn't include that at all. They, it's not their rule. We lawyers, we say, when you go into that, you're acting ultra best. You're acting outside your mandate. And of course, you, you, they can be sued um, and damages can be incurred. So it's not their job. It's not their job. Uh, yeah. Um, before we come to you, um, Omoba Shilong, you are still on the carpet. Um, I was meaning to ask you. You know, now when you buy, maybe you tell an artist, please give me a receipt. Maybe that's a contract. That's a lawyer. You're a lawyer yourself, and all that. So, but what did you do earlier on when you are buying from unknown artists? When you are collecting, I'm sure much of what you have now, they were bought more than 10 years, 15 years ago. Talking about 40 years. So what did you when do? When I was a beginning? student in university. How was it? I'm interested, actually, in what has happened and what you've gone through. Yeah. Well, I was a blind man when I started. I was a student in the University of Ibadan. I started, you know, at that time, art had no very, really had no. We didn't, I didn't know what was called Benny Wong. I didn't know Benny Wong. I was a young boy. But eventually, I got to know about him. The market was there. Um, the value was even Ben who did not sell a piece of art in his lifetime for one million naira before he died. And today, Ben Wong's work is being sold for high value. So, what happened at that time is that, again, the rule of willing buyer and willing seller. At that time, there were so many willing sellers. You know, I went into family homes of uh, Papa Aina Nobolu and uh, at uh, Sholake Street in Ibutimeta to go and look for artwork. Somebody told me. And I went there, and some of these artworks were lying know, around. Lying around. And uh, Koladi Oshino confirmed this. Um, even his own work was being used to collect debt, you know, when it was uh, just beginning. So the art market was there. We didn't know about provenance. I didn't know anything about provenance. So it was later on that I began to, when the capitals of this world began to ask for provenance, that one began to say, oh, so yeah, one has to. So now, these days, I mean, at least for the past uh, 20 years, I've been insisting that if you are selling me artwork, I want to know how you got it, I want to have the receipt, I want you to sign, I want you to indemnify me against possible adverse claim, blah, blah, blah. I even put a stamp of 50 kobo on the, on the receipt to ensure that I can have consideration and blah, blah, blah. So it has changed. It has changed from uh, an interest an uninformed interest, the word is uninformed, to a passion, again, informed passion. When it became a passion, I was very informed. 
And then when it became a recession, I was highly informed. Uh, thank you. You wanted to say something earlier. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, the uh, permits me to use the word the principle of willing buyer and willing seller. Now, the the, the role it has played in uh, using that as for to raise funds and all of that is that. Now, so when I've taken that as security, and then or taking the security on that hat as the proper languages, when the borrower, for example, defaults and then I need money to augment whatever gap he has left, then I go to the market. Now, there are no willing buyers. I am desperate to sell, but I must sell to make money. And so you see that the price goes down, and which then affects how, at the point of negotiation in the first place, I have considerations to, well, if I'm going to give you a 100 million facility, I might as well just say, I'll give you 50, even though your work of art is worth 120, because by the time I get to the market and I'm forced to sell, I sell for less. Now, those are the considerations that affect uh, transactions. Not, ne not necessarily law, but just a matter of uh, business yeah. decision. Now, let's go back to how that, whilst it might be difficult to hold government or government agencies responsible for what we have or what we do not have in the art space, something, it's, something looks like it is missing and maybe we can then hold them responsible now. If you mention, mention Picasso, a lot of people, even if they don't know in grand details Picasso, they would have heard about Picasso. If you mention Banksy, yeah, a lot of people would probably know about Banksy. Now, if you are astute about, uh, astute about collecting acts in Nigeria, you certainly know about Nwowu and uh, Njidekas and a number of them. But certainly, you don't know what happened to how he evolved, Nwowu. You don't know how a number of people evolved. Now that tells us that if we don't have history about what we have, it will be difficult to appreciate. Now, so maybe the very base, the very point to start is, let's even begin to have some, I mean, I know there, is, there are places where you teach fine art and then people with passion go there. But maybe as part of our histories, just so that we can appreciate the NWO rules of this world, the people that we have, and then we can then say, oh, okay, what has he made? What has he produced? We can begin to, we should begin to incorporate those things into curriculum and then we can have appreciation we would not appreciate or put value to what we do not know about. So just like Prince said, Nwowu, um, um, Tutu at some point sold for uh, $60 or $6. Uh, some artwork sold for 500,000 Naira. And then over a, a not, when, when they were resold for $1.1 million, they were not even in Nigeria. Some people do not even know about Tutu in Nigeria. Now, so it is possible for me to go to Belgium and say I have a tutu, and then I have more people attract attention because I have a tutu than if I come to Lagos and then I'm talking about tutu. Someone says, What are Who's you holding? Tutu? Now, so as between ourselves, as between, as within Africa or Nigeria, we need to tell our stories in a way to have appreciation for the things that we want the world all over to appreciate. And maybe that's where we can at the very least start from. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one, thank you. Um, you know, as I said earlier on, my, I was actually hoping that we exhume, you know, for us what people have actually gone through, the people who are actually leading in this uh, train. I want to come back to uh, uh, Kavita. Uh, um, I was looking at cases where works actually that are received, you know, just your personal take, you know, actually are damaged or there's some kind of maybe the artist here alive or something or the artist is not around. So what do you do? Do you, who picks the bill or something, maybe the artist looks at the work and says, I think something happened here. Maybe it's been exposed in a way that some, the color has actually changed. You know, I mean, do you have any? Um, we said works for restoration. So sometimes we get a Ben in one world, which is a beautiful work, but not in good condition. And the person who's bringing it can't afford to restore it. So what we do do is actually send it abroad because there are no restorers in this country that can do such a great job. And we have someone in England and in Germany who then restores the work. Uh, we pay for it, we bring it back, and then we deduct it from the sale from the person who's brought it in. So uh, I had someone working for me and she saw the, the gap in the market for restoration and she's just gone to Florence and she's going to be doing a course for one year to do restoration and come back. So we really need more people over here who are aware that there is an art market, that there, is, there are so many gaps to it that they can fill. And um, we need it really to have more pro pro uh, prominence. Unfortunately, uh, the government 
doesn't have history of art in its schools and its classes, so no one really going to school is aware about the art market. They're not taught it. And the museums are in a state of disrepair. Luckily, Engineer Shillon is starting a private museum, which is going to be absolutely incredible. We can't wait to come and see it on Saturday. And we're really proud that we have an individual in Nigeria who's the first one to have a private museum where people will be able to go in and, and actually see works of art that are being produced in this country and have some knowledge from that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this uh, question I just want to ask, I, I'm just going to throw it open so anyone who feels if you can. Uh, the position of the law, I realize that there's a cultural policy for Nigeria, for example, you know, so do you think that we are, I mean, there's adequacy in terms, of, in, in terms of law as it is, or there is a need? Uh, I see Oboba Shilon shifting his chair, you know, so um, <laughs> where are we? Or is there a gap for us to fill? Is it a, a case of, well, a lot of things are there in the books, but nobody's looking at them? Well, Nigeria has been making um, noise about cultural policy for some years now. Um, some people put together some put together some people, I think sometime in 1998 or something. I can't remember the date. But since then, that cultural policy is yet to see the light of the day. We don't have a cultural policy in place in Nigeria. It is yet to. In fact, I read something this morning about the Minister for Information and Culture uh, meeting with the Polish ambassador. Uh, and promising that uh, they will now do something about Nigeria's cultural policy. Um, uh, so we don't have a cultural policy in place. It's always in the works. It hasn't come out. So that is uh, in terms of cultural policy. But in terms of our laws, I think I mentioned it earlier on. I think uh, Bola Ashiru mentioned it when he was talking about the regulatory framework. Our laws are not you know, properly attuned to address the problems we are talking about uh, for art. They are more attuned to other investment vehicles that you know, my colleague there, you know, uh, stockbrokers, um, yes, are interested in because they are properly defined. Don't forget one thing. The art market is not, um, is, is opaque. The art market is not uh, well organized. For instance, as stockbrokers, if you want to, if, if a, a company was about to be battered today, and my colleague there will confirm, if a company is about to be battered today, um, what we do is that um, we look at your financial statements, your profit and loss account, your balance sheet, your value added statements, your statement of, um, you know, um, schedule of um, fixed assets and so on and so forth. And we value what we think using fundamental analysis. We use our fundamental analysis to value what we think your share value should be. Now, having done that, we will now place you vis-a-vis -vis a company of similar size, similar management, and then, you know, to now determine what we think we can allow you to sell your shares for if you are coming to the stock exchange. Now, how do you do that with Nigeria market, art market does not have a system in place. We do not have, we do not have the mechanisms, we do not have the institution. What we have is good um, patriotic citizens like Kavita and others who are risking, of course, Bola Shiru's of this world, the People who are risking everything to do something in a market that is not properly defined, and uh, making something out of it for our own glory as a people. Uh, we don't have it yet. It's not properly defined. So we should not make the mistake of trying to begin to compare the art market we have here with what obtains in other parts of the world. I was looking at um, the, what, what, what happened with the uh, Christ. Christy, Christy, um, Christine um, uh, sale of uh, Benoit. Uh, what happened was that that woman just Googled uh, Google um, free um, 
uh, art estimation. If you Google it, you see there is a, there is a Google free art, art estimation, which you can Google. She Googled it and looked at the name and then found out, ah, so this is a very important artist. And then went ahead and Google. You know, Sudebi, Sudebi, that platform is a Sudebi's platform. They come, came out with uh, what that artwork was all about. And the woman said, wow, so I can sell it for this value. We need to have things like that put in place here. I mean, we are, you know, maybe the capitals of this world, the art auction house, we grow to the extent of working with web developers and um, put in place a website that people can place um, the name of an artist uh, like Jerome Layo, and you know, you come out with um, what you think the artwork is what you, his artwork is what a work done by Jerome Layo in um, in 1980 and so on. So we need things like that. A lot of work needs to be done in the art market. Um, we, sh we should stop thinking that we, you know the art market is like the stock exchange. They're completely different. <laughs> yes, uh, John. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree. Um, and, and I think it's actually an interesting point. And I, I think there's an opportunity for us to turn this on its head, right? Because so I've, I've done work in developing markets uh, for a very long time. I'm now uh, in a developing market, and it's entirely different. So I think many of the things that we're talking about, I think, are, are, are not just about the art market. They're about developing markets in general, right? And even with respect to the stock market, I would say um, uh, the stock market in Nigeria is very much different than it is in developing markets as well. I think um, that fellow from the NSC would agree, right? So um, to, use, to use the basis that is employed in other markets and thinking it's going to work here is not really a model for success, I believe. And I think what's really important is that we create models that are actually based for us in our market. Not something that we've imported, but something that actually works for us. Okay? But, so that's just an overarching thought. So I wholly agree, it's, it's not like the stock market. But, but what does that mean? Well, I, I think what it actually means is we have the opportunity to um, come up with novel answers. Okay? Uh, and we don't have to feel that we're trapped and fixed with things that have been done in other places. I think, um, as someone who appreciates art but is not in the art market like these folks here, um, I think there's an awesome opportunity to employ more technology. Okay? Um, clearly, when we talk about provenance, it's a huge issue. Um, you know, the thing that comes to my mind, I'm sure it's been talked about, um, not exactly sure how the application would work, but something, something I think people can spend a lot of time thinking about. Because your market really is so small here right now, most of those folks are probably in this room right now, actually, right? Probably a, a large number of Nigerian arts world is probably gathered here at the moment. So something like blockchain sounds like something that might make sense to me with respect to the provenance of art, okay? Um, now, it's been used in a whole host of other applications, but we're talking about a relatively small sample set. And so, could you do something like that to get over this notion of low trust, which is where we are, we're in a low trust environment, okay? So how do you conquer that low trust issue? Perhaps it's something like that. It's a novel technology that actually just might work and could catapult this market. Because if you can't establish what, you know, who owns a thing or if a thing is real, Obviously, there's no market for it, okay? Um, as I was saying before, this whole notion of uh, willing buyer, willing seller, huge issue. There's not enough outlets, obviously, right? So what you, what you need in a market is a lot of liquidity, okay? Again, that's the issue with our stock exchange here, which is why I, I think it's not applicable to you know, compare the stock market here with stock markets elsewhere. There's very little liquidity, and what you see is that there's a real depression in price um, on that basis, right? Um, you know, are there ways using more novel technologies that we can actually increase and broaden 
uh, the market. I know we, you know, we have this um, uh, an auction house here, but is there some way to actually extend that further? Because, you know, we're trying to create, I think, a domestic market for for our art. It's clear that there's an international market for it, and that market is buoyant, and that market has a lot more liquidity. So, in the absence of liquidity, then we're not going to have that same sort of buoyant market here. Is technology another way to bridge that gap in this market? So, you know. I can make some real correlations between investing in a developing market versus developed market. I think there are actually some, um, some parallels to uh, this art market here in Nigeria. I would just simply say we don't have to be governed by what has been done elsewhere. I think the thing about regu uh, the regulatory situation and laws is the same thing. The truth is um, we shouldn't be bound by anything at the moment, right? So I think we, we love to over-legislate uh, here, I think we have way too many laws actually and not enough application of the law. I think it's a constant issue in most industries and you see it time and again. What we actually need are laws that help to facilitate um, you know, an industry that we care about. So art is the same way. There's really strong lobbying around laws in other industries. I'm not sure how much of that is going on in this art world, but I know that in other industries, manufacturing, for example, you have very strong lobbies that work hand in glove with government to actually create the law. Um, so this is another situation where I would say that has to happen as opposed to um, people who don't necessarily understand the market dictating what the law should be. So to my mind, I would just sort of flip this thing on its head and say, um, host of opportunities, let's start with a blank sheet of paper Let's say, let's not think that, you know, any idea is too crazy to consider because what we're talking about is actually really important. And, um, and it's a shame that right now people from other parts of the world value our art more than we value our own art. I think if we're going to value our art appropriately, we have to have solutions that work for us, that we create for ourselves. Yeah. Well, um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but actually, I want to extend that. I mean, what, what have you done in, the case, in cases where when you bought the works, there was no documentation from the artist? You know, you acquired the work on trust. I'm talking about transactions you had like many, many years ago. Now, this is what you do now, but you didn't do this at first. So what, I mean, what do you do in that case? You do, see, do you call the artist forgery back? did not exist in Nigeria when the market was not this commercial. It wasn't. It's a problem. Forgery arises because there is a market now. There is a lot of money. Look, nobody is going to bother to forge um, an artist that does not have a name. But I can tell you that people are sitting down in their corners now trying to forge Benny Wong because there's a lot of money to be made. At the time I bought those works we are talking about, they did not have the market value being bundled around now. They did not have it. Uh, my dear Oliver will remember that when he came to me some years back, there is a price I paid for his father's work. I, if it was now he brought those works, I will empty the, my bank account to buy it. Because the market has grown tremendously. So when the market grows, forgeries arise. So when you ask me about questions about work I bought when I was in university in the late 70s, I, Nobody gave a damn about the work of, you know, some of these artists at that time. Yes, but Ben who had a name, but he did not have the market value. The world is now uh, band, uh, uh, brandishing about it. Look, I tell you, I bought an El Anasi from Papa um, Toshtairi. An El Anasi. I bought El Anasi standing, which is now in the Yemisi Shiloh Museum, for only 250,000 naira. I got a receipt at that time because I had become aware. But can you buy a, a El Anasi for 250,000 Naira today? No. But people will go to any extent to forge El Anasi when El Anasi dies. They will forge his signature because El Anasi is going for hundreds of millions now in Naira. I'm not talking about dollars, but in dollars, you know, you're talking about close to a million dollars. I'm not talking about those um, aluminum foils, though. 
that one, they are queuing all over the world to buy it. Museums are queuing for it. But I'm talking about, look, I have some basic trades he did in 1973, 73, 74 and so, which I lent to, I lent to, the, uh, to the museum in Munich. They've just finished the exhibition. Right now, they're exhibiting in Qatar, four works from me of Ellen Asi. How much did I buy it? 30,000 Naira each. Yes, many years ago. But now, when they were taking those works out, they were valued for 100 and something thousand dollars each for a work I bought for 30,000 Naira. So the market has changed. When you're talking about forgery, please don't place those days of the late 70s, early 80s with what is happening now. Art now is money. It's money. I mean, when you have big men like Bola Shiru still opening the gallery, you think he's foolish. There's a lot of money to be made. <laughs> There's a lot of money to be made in that. Thank you. <laughs> OK, yes. Uh. Um, maybe I can, because there's a lot of um, generation gap between Prince and I, I can then add a little bit of what is left from my own generation. I, I, so when Prince then mentioned that art has changed, it brings us to the point of, I, I know Tayo mentioned something about, uh, okay, the first thing about art is passion. Uh, there is this general belief or thing going around uh, that goes around about art that, oh, it's about passion. So when I say I'm a collector, they just think Bola is collecting just so that oh, he feels good about it. Now, a little bit of change in orientation though is that, so now we can make money with that. So if word on the street now, or if word gets more on the street that you can make money from art, you can use it to collect loan, I mean, for whatever what, we begin to add value to it. Then forgery comes in, but then there's a bigger market. Now, it means that there are more needs in the market. So whether we can afford it or not, to, for the market to grow, we then need to have a market for the authentication of these artworks it becomes very important. And maybe you can route it through blockchain or whatever, but that has to happen. But beyond all of that is the, is the we have to move away from the 1973 uh, mindset that it's just for collectors and passionate art lovers. There is money to be made. And henceforth, everything that comes around ensuring that I get value for money has to be put in place. Now, who pays for that? I, I, I cannot answer. But if we, are, if we intend to derive benefit from the market for us, then it means that most of us sitting in this room would have to, one way or the other, look for ways to ensure that those things are put in place. Otherwise, we may as well just go back to 1973 when arts were worth um, just 30,000 Naira. Thank you. Well, it was in 1970, it was the late 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so thank you uh, so much. Uh, I think um, a lot has been said and a lot has been thrown up. Um, there's no doubt that's the best way to begin to arrive at decisions, at actually taking steps forward is to begin to talk the way we are doing. And uh, many of us are learning, I've learned a lot uh, this evening. Uh, many of us are taking notes, and those who can make a difference are actually taking their notes as well. So I want to invite um, someone to come and introduce uh, who comes next. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very good panel discussion. Very, very educative. I'm sure we've all learned a lot from it. Thank you. We'll be, we'll be rounding up now, very soon. To close the ceremony, I'd like to invite the founder and executive director of the Benemu Foundation, Mr. Oliver Iwonwu. A round of applause as it comes up. Thank you. Well, the conversations have started, and it's been very interesting, very insightful. And I think that's what Point of View is all about, starting these conversations. It's not only about art being decorative or art having aesthetic value, but it's also about looking at it you know, as an investment. And I think this is where the game changes for Nigerian and indeed African art. Um, I had to wait until um, Omobayemisi Shilon sat before you know, I decided to tackle him. Well, I'll just start by saying that um, as a politician, if I embezzled a million naira in 1973, sorry, 1970s, you know, and um, 
there would have been a lot of noise about that. But if I do the same thing now in uh, 2019, big deal, what's for millionaire really? So that's my response to that. Yeah. Okay. 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 So while I agree that our market is still unclear and opaque, however, the same applies to other international art markets like the UK and even the United States. I agree with John, who spoke brilliantly, that there is a developing market here. We cannot sit back and agree that our market is not developed or is not even developing, especially when we see staggering amounts being achieved at domestic and international auctions. So what are we then doing? There are definitely opportunities here for appraisers, restorers, those who will store artworks according to the proper conditions, installers, art lenders, and even other related businesses, advisories, of course, the insurance, you know, someone mentioned art insurance, art lenders, and all sorts of businesses that come along, including the art historians and those who write critical texts. So I see opportunities and a lot of uh, development going on. So for me, let's jumpstart the process. We don't need to have a perfect system. Indeed, there's no perfect system anywhere in the world. But the best place to start is by starting with blue chip artists, those who have consistent value over many years and even decades. That's an easy way to start. The data is out there on the local scene and on the international scene. So must this value only reside in the auction houses or at the galleries, for instance? Why can't I take a work of art to a bank and get collateral on it? And I believe there are a lot of bankers here, a lot of investment people here. The opportunities are there. Like John said, how do we create our models? We can't continue to berate the system. How can we build a system? How can we take advantage of the opportunities that are available? I think this is where the conversation starts. And on that note, I'll just start by, I'll just end by thanking all the other people, you know, who have contributed to the success of Point of View so far and who have supported the foundation. I'll start with our host and partners, Alliance Francaise, Stroke Mike Adenuga Center, our distinguished audience who have been so patient. You know, we started a little late and we're ending even late as well. So I thank them tremendously for their patience and I hope they've thoroughly enjoyed themselves. I'll continue with the distinguished speakers and panelists, Bola Ashiru, Tayo Fagbule, Omoba Yemisu Shilon, Kavita Chelaram, Professor Koin Ajay, who was represented, he had to go early, uh, who was represented by Ephraim Ajilola, who did a great job, and of course, John Opubo. I'd also like to thank our moderator, Dakwa Adeniyi. We'd also like to thank some of the great artists who are here with us. Sorry if I miss out anyone. There's Edosa Igugo, there's Victor Hikameno, there's Romy Siche, Tony Nsofo, Doton Alabi, Same Bohon, Nenge Omoku, Nobot Oku, and of course, um, George Igodalo, and of course, my good friend who um, raised a few pointers, Ayo Akinwande. I'd also like to thank some of the great collectors here, some of whom have been collecting them before I was even born. We've got uh, Professor Zebun Clark, and of course, her husband, Professor John Pepper Clark. There's also the great Frank Momo, who raised the question earlier, and the great Billy Osemweji. There's also Delia Wushika, and of course, my friend Neil Coventry. I'd also like to thank our partners and sponsors. Um, there's Atirama, My Dream Gallery, Red Door Gallery, Jackson Eti Anidu, Hondido, Connect, V Connect, The Soul Adventurer, Ono Bello, and Wildflower. Finally, I'd like to thank those who worked with me behind the scenes at the Bene Wong Foundation. There's Lado Gidon, there's uh, Oyinda Olanio, Oyuno Ahimere, our anchor. There's Emmanuel Wanchuku and Rhoda Adeola. I thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you all at the next talk, same venue with our partners on the 4th of November. Goodbye and God bless.
the international streams are beginning to affect the local market. Uh, a lot of Nigerian art is being sold in auctions abroad. I think the numbers are not that great in terms of volume, but it's sending a message. The shock waves are coming to the market. Um, people are buying now because they realize that Benin Wonwo, who is being sold for one and a half a million dollars, was sold, was bought by some people, maybe the same people for like 30,000 naira.